Because today is Trinity Sunday, this morning I want to talk about experiencing God as he truly is. Experiencing God as he truly is. Indeed, to experience God as he truly is is to experience God as Holy Trinity. And that is so because that's what God is. Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That is to say that that category of existence that we call God or the divine exists, indeed has always existed and is shared fully and equally by three persons. Three persons, that is, as we know them commonly, as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The first thing that I'd like us to notice that to experience God as Trinity is to experience God as God is revealed to us in Jesus Christ. To experience God as Trinity is to experience God as God is revealed to us in Jesus Christ. Indeed, there are many things in the life and ministry of Jesus that speak of his own divine nature and his equality with God the Father and also that the Holy Spirit is God. So that the revelation of God that we have in Jesus Christ is that the Father is God and the Son is God and the Holy Spirit is God. And that God is a trinity of persons is suggested in various events in the life of Jesus, not least of which is baptism, which you'll remember. Indeed, in Matthew chapter 3 and beginning at verse 16, we read, And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were open to him. So Jesus is there. And he saw the Spirit of God. So there's the Holy Spirit descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven. Whose voice? Well, listen to what he said. Behold, a voice from heaven came and said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I'm well pleased. That's the voice of the Father. The Son is there. The Holy Spirit is there. The Father is there saying, this is my beloved Son with whom I'm well pleased. Another example that God is a trinity of persons is seen in the way that Jesus describes God and what we commonly refer to as the Great Commission. That Great Commission that Jesus gave after his resurrection and prior to his ascension into heaven. We read in Matthew chapter 28 and beginning at verse 19, and Jesus said to the apostles, and now go. I'm leaving and I'm sending you. <laughs> go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name. Not names. In the name. Well, what's the name? Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. God's name is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Namas. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And behold, as you do this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And so that's the first thing. To experience God as Trinity is to experience God as God is revealed to us in Jesus Christ. Secondly, to experience God as Trinity is to experience God as God is revealed to us in the Hebrew Scriptures. Indeed, even in the Old Testament, prior to the revelation that we have of God and Jesus Christ, we find seemingly hints of divine plurality. And so we read in the very first chapter, the first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1, and verse 26, and then God said, let us, let us, Who are the others that you're referring to? Let us make man in our image and our likeness. 
a hint of a plurality of the divine. Or when we come to Genesis chapter 18 and Abram before his name was changed to Abraham, the father of many, when he was still Abram. We read in chapter 18 and beginning at verse 1, And the Lord, the Lord Yahweh, appeared to Abram by the oaks of, by the oaks of Mamre, and as Abram sat at the door of his tent in the heat of the day, and he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, three men. <laughs> How interesting. He lifted up his eyes and behold... Three men were standing in front of him, front of him, and when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the earth and said, O oh Lord, <laughs> not O oh Lords, <laughs> O oh Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, do not pass by your servant. That's where the old gospel hymn, pass me not, pass me not. Isaiah 6, as Femi read it to us this morning. Isaiah 6, and beginning at verse 1, the prophet Isaiah said, In the year that King Uzziah died, the king of Judah, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, a vision lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple, and above him stood the seraphim, that's, that's angelic beings. Each had six wings, with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, 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 three men <laughs> and three men. Why? <laughs> Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. The Lord, God is holy, holy, holy. <laughs> the whole earth is full of his glory. And so God is seemingly, as Hank Hanegraaff put it, God is one what and three who. One what, one category of it, and three who. How many gods? One God. How many persons make up God? Three. And they talk to each other. And they send one another. And they obey. Jesus said, I do always those things that please the Father. I'm sending you as he sent me. And I'm going to ask him and he's going to send the Holy Spirit. Another comforter, Allah, just like me. In fact, it's very interesting. The Holy Spirit, I suppose, is the most interesting. The Holy Spirit doesn't much say anything. In fact, when he speaks, he speaks to the prophets. And the Holy Spirit is constantly pointing away. Look to the Father. Believe in the Son. <laughs> and he's the one, like the wind, and you don't know where it comes from and you don't know where it's going but he causes us to be born again. And when Jesus left and the Spirit came, another comforter just like me, Jesus said, nobody, none of the apostles said, well, man, this is no good. This is bunk. Where's Jesus? No, no, the Holy Spirit was very satisfying because he's God too. And so God is one what and three who. That is one category of existence that is shared equally by three distinct persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so that's the second thing. To experience God as Trinity is to experience God as God is revealed to us in the Hebrew Scriptures. Finally, to experience God as Trinity is to experience God as God is proclaimed to us in the writings of the apostles. Or writings that they inspired and were written on their behalf. Indeed, there are many things written in the New Testament that speak of the divinity of Jesus. In Mark chapter 2, he forgives sins. In fact, those who were there objected when he said to the man on the pallet, your sins are forgiven you. They said to themselves, who does he think he is, God? 
Only God can forgive sins. And then he said, that, he said, which is easier for me to say your sins are forgiven or to say to him, take up your pallet and walk, but that you might know that I have the power and the authority and the prerogative to, to forgive sins. And then he turned to the man, get up and, and walk. And he did. And so Jesus forgives sins. Jesus describes himself as the one who's the final judge of the nations of the world. Moses never made that claim. Isaiah never made that claim. Jesus made that claim. Why? Because that's exactly the way it's going to go down. And when he, the Son of Man, comes in all of his glory, he will separate the nations as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats and judge them according to the things that they've done. That's a divine prerogative. And it's a prerogative that Jesus takes unto himself. Jesus forgives sins. Jesus judges the world. Jesus has called God both directly and indirectly in the New Testament. We are awaiting our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, Titus 2 and 13. There's just one example. Or Thomas kneeling before Jesus and saying, my Lord and my God. So not only does he do what only God can do, he's even called God in the New Testament. And there are many things written in the New Testament that speak of the divinity of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is creator and recreator. The Holy Spirit is redeemer. The, it, we're told in Romans chapter 8 that it was the Holy Spirit that raised Christ from the dead. Which spirit also lives in you, Paul's argument is, and so he will raise you from the dead as well. And so there are many things written in the New Testament that speak of the divine equality that exists between God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. And so the, div the divine equality that exists between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit seem very, very simply a, a thing assumed. For instance, when the Apostle Paul concludes his, what we know as his second letter to the believers at Corinth with this Trinitarian blessing. In 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 14, and so Paul ends his letter and says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, what is, he's the source of divine grace, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God, that is the love of the theos, as often is the, tr the traditional formula, the Lord, the theos, the spirit, that is the Lord Jesus the Theos, God the Father and the Holy Spirit, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And Paul uses this kind of language because that's what God is. Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Indeed, this is the God that loves you. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and, and this is the God that calls you into fellowship, into community. Indeed, God is a community of persons. Have you ever thought about that in, in his first letter? The Apostle John said, God is love. Well, in order for love to take place, there has to be an object. And for God to be loved means it's a statement of the eternal, the timeless. And if God is, is love and timeless because God is eternal, there has to be plurality in the Godhead in order for love to take place. It, love can't take place with one person. But God is a community of persons. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And before it, anything was ever spoken into existence, the Father loved the Son, and the Son loved the Father. The Father loved the Spirit, and the Spirit loved the Son. And the Spirit loved the Father. They didn't create us because God was lonely. <laughs> One monk said, God created us because he thought we'd enjoy it. <laughs> We're the ones who benefit from creation. 
Because in that, we have the possibility of knowing personally this triune God. And so God is a community of persons. Indeed, someone has written, the point of the Christian life is not you making God a part of your life, which we have a tendency to do because we consume everything else. So let's consume a little bit of God. <laughs> the point of the Christian life is not you making God a part of your life. Rather, the point of the Christian life is God making you a part of his life. Inviting you into the dance and drama of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Into, a, 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 into God's life, a life of community. A community of persons that have existed before all creation. A community of persons that was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. And so I wonder, is that how you're experiencing God? <laughs> experiencing God as he truly is. Let us pray. I think, Lord, that if you gave us just the smallest glimpse. In fact, I think of, I think of Moses, and Moses said, Sh Lord, show me your glory. And he said, all right, I'm going to put you in the cleft of the rock. And then I'm going to cover you with my hand as I pass by. And I'm going to let you see my hinder parts. <laughs> If we could just get a glimpse of who you are and all of your wonder and glory and all the things that transcend our, the possibilities of our own expanded imaginations, we would fall in love with you and be drawn to you in every possible way. But too often, Lord, our thoughts of you are so small. And our thoughts of things so small are so big. And we get things all turned around. Lord, I pray that you'd give us a vision. And maybe we've gotten a bit of a glimpse this morning. Even as we considered Isaiah. And as we considered these things this morning. To understand how great you are. And that your greatness is expressed primarily <coughs> in showing mercy. That you love us. And you're merciful. And you want us to enter in to communion with you. Give us an appetite and a taste for it, I pray. For your glory and our soul's health, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.